Hello, my ducks. Oh, that's a new one, isn't it? Ducks. Not mentioned anything uh, anything bird related before in relation to you, but there we go. I do apologise if that's offended. Quack, quack. Um, welcome back to the library is open. So I hope you brought your library cards, my darlings. Uh, how are we doing today? I hope you're well. I am filming this on a Sunday and um, it's what time is it it's about quarter to five at night in the interest of honesty and openness um but by the time you see this it will be the monday morning and the reason for that is because i wanted to sort of mark the day with this video for which that will become clear as we go along and do a sort of very sort i do a sort of special vlog i suppose in a way although not really that different to my normal ones but I'll give you some context. Um, so I am currently, which I mentioned a couple of videos ago, or possibly the last video, depending on which order I upload them in, that I am uh, directing a new show. So that's lovely. I have some work um, before I go back to teaching. And uh, the show is called Killer Queen. And it is written and produced by Kieran Mason for Sodomite Arts Company. And uh, rehearsals will start this very day as this video is uploaded. So that's really, really exciting. Um, so um, what I thought might be quite interesting was um, for me to talk a little bit about some of the research that I've done um, in approaching the the play that I'm about to direct. Um, there will be details for the show down below in the, uh, in the description. And if you are Manchester based, if you fancy it, that would be amazing. Do come. Um, so yeah, a little bit about the show. So Killer Queen is a queer <laughs> theatre piece that started out as a one-person show when I first saw it, um, and then has since developed through various stages into a kind of six-person ensemble show, which tells the story of Freddie, uh, who's our sort of lead protagonist, um, through um, essentially three decades of his life, uh, and also inv involves the club scene, um, the political climate of the time and also a bit of murder <gasps> Ooh. so you know classic classic ingredients that i would love and respond to so um although i've done some work on the script which i'm not going to mention here in terms of looking at how i'm going to work with it what i have done also is for the last couple of weeks i've been sort of drip feeding myself research for the time um, and you know the sort of periods that are covered and I thought I'd just share a little bit with that for you today because with it being me a lot of those are books so so there we go so um, I hope that sounds interesting so stick around um, and and let's get into it I guess so the first one I sort of started to work with was uh, United Queerdom by Dan Glass um, from the Legends of the Gay Liberation Front to the Queers of Tomorrow. Now, I've actually had this book for ages. I think I bought it when it was first published, which would have been last year. Yes. Um, and then I just got around to reading it as part of, of this research. And this is a kind of overview of uh, like five decades, basically, of... Would it be five decades? Yeah, five decades of um, queer liberation, campaigning... Um, protest so on and so forth not only on a macro level sort of globally but also on like a local level which I just think is really important to as a sort of refresher because I remember a lot of this from when it happened but you know oftentimes you'll find yourself you're so familiar with a subject um, either through being there or through reading about it that you actually just sort of blank on some of the details so it's really worth revisiting and and what I really liked about this was that it's, it's an active text that speaks to um, how people did and can fight for their rights, fight for representation, fight for justice, um, and, uh, in, in quite, in sort of like a lo-fi punk kind of way, which really appeals to me. So this was kind of overview. I guess I structured my research almost subconsciously to start with, like, the bigger and then coming, you know, into the finer details. So that was United Quid. I do recommend, it's, it's really nicely written and, and, and it pootles along, pootles along. <laughs> it runs along quite nicely um but yeah that's that's book number one that i started with um then moved on to uh which did i do next ah yes of course so this is slightly more specific to one of the decades in which arguably the bulk of the action might take place um and this is gay in the 80s by colin clues from fighting for our rights to fighting for our lives now colin has a uh, a blog 
on the internet, also called Gay in the 80s, which I will link in the description. And this is a sort of um, overview of the decade in question that's kind of split into several sort of subcategories. So there's one about visibility, communities, uh, mainstream politics, and then obviously the HIV epidemic. But it focuses in on aspects of culture as well in terms of like the music scene and the... Um, sorry, somebody just texted me while I was filming this if you wondered um, why I was squinting. Um, so, um, yeah, the music scene, uh, theatre, performance, so on and so forth, uh, television and all that sort of stuff. So it's really a kind of social and cultural history of the decade, as well as it deals with the politics of the time. And I just thought that was really, really important to, because that is something that I'm very committed to bringing into my role as director, which is to, um, not saturate is too strong a word, but like, make the culture that would have been around at the time an implicit part of the world that we're going to create with the actors you know and again this is really really well written there's some lovely stuff from a first person point of view uh colin clue's worked um in social work with uh people with uh hiv aids that's um that's a really interesting part of the book and very very worth reading just to look at not only policy but also how that operated on a practical level at the time so this has been an excellent resource and i've definitely been taking this into the rehearsal room and then slightly more esoteric i suppose in some respects and i have featured this one on a haul vlog before i forget when and um, this is uh, out of the shadows the psychology of gay men's lives by wolf odette Wolf, Wolf, <laughs> Wafer, Walt Odets, which I thought might be an interesting companion to just sort of remind myself about, you know, all the characters we encounter in the play are in one form or another part of the queer community. And, you know, I thought it'd be useful just to have a sort of, not to layer it on too thickly in the text, but just to be sort of thinking about the influences on their lives, how they interact with their world and what might cause it not because people are um are what has happened to them but oftentimes what has happened to them both on a micro and macro level imprints on them and can go some ways to explaining behaviors um there's some really really interesting stuff here about um uh, generations that that was probably my favorite chapter where um the writer who is a psychologist i believe or a therapist one of the two um what he calls the tripatriot tripar tripatite 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 um however that's spelled um there's a great quote about that isn't there it's someone once said if you mispronounce a word that's great because it just means you read it in a book so let's go with that um and he sort of talks about the the how many queer people that are alive today particularly i mean especially he, he talks specifically about gay men in here in relation to uh politics and hiv aids and stuff like that but um he talks about like the sort of people that were alive before the aids epidemic the people that were young during it and then the people who've never experienced it and how different influences kind of imprint on their lives and i just thought that was really really interesting i don't necessarily agree with all of it but then it's not for me to agree or disagree with i am not a, i don't work in the field of psychology and therefore you know i i give over to 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 mr odets and and his far superior knowledge in that area but it was very very fascinating and um very well written i will say it's it's taken from the American perspective. So obviously a British one will be more culturally um, relevant to the play that I'm doing. And obviously every country that had a book like this would have its own particular influences, but you get the idea. But that was helpful just to remind myself of what the sort of bigger influences were on people's psyches and the way they interact with the world. Uh, slightly more, I don't want to say it's lighthearted because I don't think it is lighthearted at all. This is Mercury and Me by Jim Hutton. Who, and it's the sort of autobiography, if you will, of of his relationship with Freddie Mercury leading from their first meeting up to um, after Freddie's death, obviously. And the reason for that is, as you probably guessed by the title, there are many influences from the Queen frontman. Not only is the, uh, the lead protagonist name-checking uh, Freddie Mercury, but also um, that sort of theatricality I guess of Freddie and Queen more generally and and you know the sort of 
how they were responding to reacting to the culture the politics the the world if you will at the time which you know overlaps with the period in question in the play i found this really really interesting because although i am like a sort of i'm a queen fan i would say but i wouldn't say i was a queen fanatic as in i wouldn't necessarily have or maybe i would at the time have gone to see them if they were live and i had the chance but i'm interested enough but i didn't know an awful lot about freddy um a pal of mine was in bohemian rhapsody the movie that's very good um and i have seen we will rock you the musical which isn't anything to do with queen but just use the music beautifully um so i just thought that was really interesting for a bit more context about freddie as a person and you know uh, where those influences might lie in either the main protagonist or possibly all the characters and again just more pop culture from the time you know this would have been a big thing when we're sort of incorporating research into performance is that we don't announce that it's research because if we truly believe that we're in the time period that we're in it's second nature to most people like now if we talk about the pandemic um if we were making a play in 40 years time we, um about this period we would have to remember that for us lot now as we do as we are sorry we know all about it because it's been a part of our lived experience you know so we would talk about it differently than if we were trying to teach someone about something you get the idea um on the subject of biographies i also grabbed uh this by michael cashman uh one of them which is his autobiography going from his early childhood up to his uh, being, I was going to say indoctrinated then, <laughs> inducted into the House of Lords and it sort of again goes through his career as an actor and his relationships and stuff and there is some stuff about gay culture in here at the time um, and also obviously he had this, he had the um, the particular notoriety of being Barry who was part of the first male same-sex kiss on EastEnders and then he talks a lot about what what the newspapers looked like at the time and how they responded to things. There's stuff about campaigning and Section 28, um, which was a part of the government legislation, as well as the age of consent, because he obviously went into politics later on. And um, But it's a really, really easy to read memoir and it evokes very vividly at the time, um, you know, to, to, a, to a greater or lesser degree that was lived by all the characters in the play, although obviously there is some slight adjustment for, you know, class, social status, what you were doing for a job at the time, so on and so forth. And that's important to bear in mind too. But this was really, really good fun. Now, fun is the wrong word because there's actually some, some really tragic moments in it. A, gri a gripping read, let's go with that. Um, on the subject of that, actually, I, ha I also listened to, um, about class adjustments, I also listened to... Uh, well, I read one and I'm listening to the other at the moment on audio book and that is uh, The Swimming Pool Library by Alan Hollinghurst and also the, the Line of Beauty by Alan Hollinghurst as well which was adapted into a BBC TV show um, again these were sort of less and this is not a critique, they were sort of less useful on a practical level because they do speak about a very particular class of people but they are very much av of the period in sort of Thatcher's Britain um of the late uh, the mid to late 80s um but again a lot of it obviously is set in quite upper class environments or a very particular kind of person and while I do admire a lot of Alan Hollinghurst's writing there is something about he's like his use of language is beautiful but you always feel and again this is not a critique it's just an observation a little bit distanced from the characters in the sense that when i'm reading about them i don't perhaps that's just a me thing but i don't really care about them as characters they're not likable but then likable characters is not a prerequisite so again more atmos basically even if it is a very specific kind of um you know subsection of people although what he does do is write quite nicely about pubs clubs and and hookups and stuff which are a big part of the play so again useful uh swimming pool library is probably my favorite as opposed to if or between the two as opposed to the line of beauty um yeah i just thought it flowed better for me and it's not as long <laughs> but um but hey ho there we go um, the next one, oh, I forgot about this as well. This is another non-fiction one, which I have actually read before 
on Kindle, but I really wanted to get the paperback edition of this to refer to again, and just because I love the cover. And this is by Paul Flynn, um, who, uh, and it's called Good As You, From Prejudice to Pride, 30 Years of Gay Britain. Now, this, again, is a sort of, in a similar style to how um, uh, Gay in the 80s was, is separated into several kind of subsections about the development of culture and, and queer rights, acceptance, and indeed creation and participation in culture of the time from sort of, I can't remember when it actually starts, I believe it starts in the 70s as I recall, um, and it sort of goes into various subsections, uh, including uh, music, um, football, TV, um, again, um, you know, all these sort of wider cultural things. There's some really, really good stuff, though, about the gay scene in here, particularly the gay scene in Manchester and how that developed. And obviously, we're staging the show in Manchester. Um, so it was important to look at, or rather, it is important to look at the, the kind of pub scene culture that was around at the time. When this is excellent for that. Uh, it really, really is uh, backed up by, you know, having discussions with my dad who accessed the gay scene in the time period. Um, maybe going to try and get him to speak to the actors on Zoom if he's game. Um, and also supported by these, which I managed to get off um, eBay as props for the show and also additional research, which are um, old copies of Gay Times and Gay News um, from um, 85 and 80. Eight, I believe, or maybe 87 respectively, and I just thought they were fantastic. I mean, not only are they mint, but they're also, um, you know, uh, like a social record, basically, of history. See, what's really strange is when I started reading these magazines, which would probably been early 2000 or something like that, they didn't, although they were in colour by then, they don't actually look that much different. It's only in the last sort of 10 years that um that gay magazines have started to look very different i would arguably say that they're not as good but hey ho um but the, these are just gorgeous and they kind of show you you know like uh, personals adverts um shows that are on theater that was on at the time and also the club scene seeing that's so important again for additional bits of um bits of knowledge so i'm going to share those in rehearsal with the actors um finally this is a little curio <laughs> That I, that I read about on a vlog and then managed to, on a vlog, sorry, managed to pick up on eBay. It's called Queens by Pickles. And it's a kind of collection of essays about queer culture in the 80s and the sort of types or tribes of queens. Um, you know, um, as, as a queer community, we do tend to sort of section people off into particular tribes, if you will. So nowadays we'd be sort of talking about you know, bears, which are hairier, heavier gay men, um, twinks, young gay men, um, otters who are hairy but slim and tall, and there's a whole thing. Have a little Google around if you're interested. But um, these are these are sort of like bitchy little, almost private, almost um, private eye sketches, um, but again, all set on the queer scene. And I thought these would make a really interesting sort of character study for rehearsals. Um, it's I'm not quite sure how they were um, received at the time, and I imagine now that they're quite problematic, but it is important to remember what the culture of the time was, as opposed to what we would like the culture of the time to have been, you know, and those are two different things. So there we go. And finally, for this bit, my last little bits of research, um, I'm going to put these two together because they both kind of fed off each other in slightly different ways. Uh, this is uh, Let's Get Back to the Party by Zach Sally. Um, and Gay Bar Why We Went Out by Jeremy Atherton Lynn. Now, not only are they commendable in, in, in the first respect for both being about queer culture, that is not white and cis, uh, necessarily. Um, you know, and that's harder to find than you might imagine. We've discussed this in previous vlogs, but what they really sort of do, in particularly this one, and um, this is almost like the manual, if you will, or the biographical version, whereas this is a fictionalization, is that they analyze particularly bar and hookup culture on a very practical level, um, and in terms of what they meant to queer people. You know, when we went to um, 
we went to look at the venue for the show the other day, um, which is hidden in Manchester. It's a beautiful kind of nightclub that's set in, uh, that's um, housed in an old mill. We um, there was a, there's a sign on the door talking about um, I'm paraphrasing here about how important queer cult um, nightlife is to queer culture, and I think that's really true. Um, and of course, because we're staging it in a club, a lot of the scenes take place in clubs, and therefore that culture you know, through, you know, the club kids, the Blitz kids, the, um, the Heaven, one of the hugest gay nightclubs in London, the cabaret bars, the, the fashion choices, again, the tribal thing, the, the, the hookups or the, you know, how, how you meet people, what, what you were drinking, what was being played and stuff. It's just so important to get that right. Not, not the saying that I'm a slave to research, but it's really important to get it right. Um, and, you know, um, the gay bar while we went out and um, although it is american does deal a lot with um some bars in the uk as well it sort of goes back from the present day into the past as it were it's really 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 interesting on a sort of personal level although of course people do experience things from a person-centered point of view don't they you know it's like it's not necessarily an objective thing, but then again, that's not how we experience culture. And then again, it might, they might seem like slightly strange bedfellows, but this is, um, the novel is about, um, it's set in 2015, this, and it's, but it sort of looks at various attitudes towards the increasing mainstreaming of queer culture. Now, you know, and what that sort of argument is from some people who want that mainstreaming, some people who don't, some people who still believe in queerness as like a radical force. And I think, there are examples of both of those point of views in the play. Although obviously they weren't necessarily to know where we'd come to in terms of legal protections and rights and so on and so forth. But again, just great to remind yourself that, as I said with the other one, people experience things subjectively, not objectively. And, and it's just another thing to bear in mind. Really good read though, this was. Really, really interesting read. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that made some sort of sense to you. I'm, I, I, I'm aware that I've gabbled quite a lot and I'm just sort of reaming off things to, to let you know. But um, yeah, that's that's the research that I've done thus far into the, uh, the world of Killer Queen, which is coming soon to Manchester. Uh, 7th to 9th of September at Hidden and again as before I will put what details I have about the company and the production in the description so I hope you've enjoyed that little insight and um, what I might do is vlog again a little bit further into the rehearsal process if you're interested with some of the actors and maybe I'll have a sit down chat with the writer as well and he can talk a little bit about how he came to uh, compose the text so let me know if that's something you fancy. Uh, but for now, this is your director signing off. Uh, so put those library cards away somewhere safe. Uh, let me know if you enjoyed this. Uh, if you didn't, then don't let me know because uh, there's nothing I can do about it now. And, um, and wish me a, a happy first day of rehearsals today. All right, my darlings, stay theatrical, stay book sniffy. It's not a word, we're not bothered. And take wonderful care of yourself and the people around you. Much love. Mwah.